Trevor and Monique, a massive welcome to the Lead on Purpose podcast. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Oh, it's so great to connect. Look, um, you guys do incredible things, uh, not only for high performers, athletes, leaders, uh, but for the everyday human. And we're going to get to talking about your business. Uh, but just to get the ball rolling, I'd love to just ask you, when you think of leadership, what comes to mind? Wow, that's, that's an interesting question because I, I have a military background. So for the first 15 years of my life as a naval officer, I'm not sure they taught us leadership that well. You had to learn it on the job. But I think it's different in different situations. And today, leadership is um, very important and very different because we're in fairly turbulent times. And if you've got a team of people that are fairly young, like we have, they need a bit of guidance and direction and, and reassurance more than anything. Mm-hmm. Mentoring. Mentoring, yeah. 100%. Yeah, this is that now more than ever, leadership is vital, really, when we look at what's happening globally and obviously regionally as well, that there's great challenges with, with COVID, with the economy, you know, lots of uncertainty and obviously other, other factors now geopolitically. So when we go back to looking at your company, like, all companies that I believe they're formed to either solve a problem or to add something positive to society. So what was the catalyst uh, of inspiration that started your company? Monique was, so she can explain. (laughs) So when I was 22, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune condition of the central nervous system. There wasn't then and still isn't a known cure for MS. So Dad, I'm an only child, so obviously it it turned our whole family upside down, but probably no one more than my dad. We basically went on this journey looking for not necessarily ways to cure the MS, but ways to improve my quality of life and improve the outcome of the disease. So we spoke to naturopaths, nutritionists, scientists, you name it, all over the world looking you know, I, I tried some crazy treatments. I mean, I had everything from shark cartilage to duck embryo stem cells to at one point someone had me taking something like 20 or 30 individual vitamin tablets every day. And we thought, look, none of these are the solution. But what we did come back to was there was a common thread from all the recommendations from all these different practitioners. And that was that Good nutrition and lifestyle are critical for anybody, but particularly anyone who has chronic illness. So essentially, that was the catalyst for starting Newsest as a company. There's a bit of history between then and how we got to where we are now, but that's what set it all going. That's amazing. That's really, really deeply emotional, I imagine, for you guys to go back to that starting point and realize it was a very personal reason that you started the company. Yeah, it wasn't. We didn't start the business for the purpose of creating a business. That just grew organically. Um, and we made lots of expensive mistakes along the way because we didn't have a plan at the start. We didn't plan to build a business. We just planned to make some products that worked, uh, particularly for Monique. Uh, and it grew from there. But uh, yeah, now we have a real business and we have to be serious about it. Yeah, I love it. And let's talk about the whole connection between our, our immunity, our immune system, and nutrients or micronutrients, and, and how they, are, you know, what's the importance of being aware of the micronutrients that we actually need, and how that impacts or can impact our immunity. Look, everyone is different. That's the first thing. So there are uh, there are genetics, there's background, there's lifestyle, there's what your diet is. All of those sorts of things are going to influence what you need, and you don't necessarily know what you need because there are so many nutrients that aren't even studied so the first thing i would say is that food is the most important thing not supplements so we always say that so a healthy balanced diet is critical you know rich in all the colors of the rainbow particularly plant-based that's where most of your nutrients are and what we set out to do was to say okay how do you create some sort of insurance for people And that is, how do you try and fill the gaps that may be missing from someone's diet? Because we do know that, you know, there's poor soil quality, which means we don't get the nutrients we're used to in our food. Uh, We uh, have this fast-paced lifestyle where we eat fast food, we miss meals. uh, We like to indulge in food that that, that is not, not that good for you, and therefore that creates extra stress on the body. Um, there are some people whose biochemistry doesn't don't convert certain things into the new, essential nutrients that we need. 
So what we did was put together a formula that essentially was not therapeutic in nature, but it helps fill the gaps. And it's all of those nutrients that we our body is one big chemical factory. And to make it work properly, that's whether it's our cognition or our immune system or our gut health or our joints and our bones, all of those things use the same nutrients to one degree or another. And so it, it's all one balance. So what you've got to do is make sure you've, you've filled all the gaps, make sure you've got all the ingredients in that chemical formula. If you remember from chemistry at school, you leave something out of that formula and it doesn't work properly. Um, sometimes we don't know which one it is. So, you know, you just uh, eat the best you can, supplement uh, if you need to. Uh, if you need particular essential nutrients that are missing, I mean, that's where you're going to your health practitioner and finding out if there's something wrong. You're doing blood tests and hair samples and all of those sorts of things to find out if you need to supplement even more with one particular nutrient. So it might be that you're particularly deficient in iron. We deliberately don't put iron in our formula because you know, too much iron is not good for you um, and you really should check to see. You don't want to OD on iron. And it, it's that sort of thing that you've got to do. So it's a balance. If you're ill, you go and get some help. You see what's wrong. You might supplement further to what you have. So mm -hmm. the immune system is no different to the rest of the bodily function. No, and I guess with your body systems, they all rely on each other, right? You're, you know, they say a chain is only as strong as the weakest link. That's the same with all the systems in your body. Your immune system is not going to function properly unless your digestive system is functioning properly. And there's a whole lot of research about, you know, the gut-brain connection. So talking about if your digestive system isn't functioning properly, your cognitive ability is not going to be optimal either. So the whole idea with our product, particularly Good Green Vitality, is it's all about improving your baseline health. So it's about trying to support all of your body systems all at the same time. So that you can basically, you know, achieve the best level of health in every area. And how did you find that yourself, Monique? Obviously, you had some challenges um, that inspired you to take action and start to look for solutions. How have you found that journey? And has there been things, breakthroughs that have really supported your health? For my health, I mean, look, I, I am still medicated for my MS, but I also have, according to my neurologist, a very aggressive form of MS. So when unmedicated, I get sick straight away. Um, I have relapsing remitting MS, which means I'll have, I'll have an episode, but then I do recover. They say that generally you only recover about, you know, anywhere between 70 to 90%, I think was the threshold when you have a relapse. And then over time, it, uh, your recovery rate decreases and you go into a chronic condition what's helped me with the keeping up my nutrition and lifestyle and making sure that my baseline health is good is when I do have these episodes, I recover almost 100%. So I, the medication keeps the illness at bay, but I credit nutrition and lifestyle to my ability to recover. You know, I, when I was first diagnosed, I was told I'd likely be in a wheelchair by the time I was 30. Uh, I turned 40 this Friday and I am still walking, running, exercising, working full time. I have a three year old daughter who runs me around in circles. And that's, yeah, I credit all of that to lifestyle and nutrition. Just to clarify that a little bit as well, when Monique was first diagnosed, there was very, very limited medication. The medication that was available did not work. Um, and it worked for some people, it didn't work for me. The, the, the interference didn't work for anyone the reality is they didn't work. And so it was lifestyle and nutrition that actually helped Monique overcome those early years. Because when she was first diagnosed, she was in a bad state, you know, um, affected her eyesight, affected her walk, walking, affected her, you know, she was a, a graphic designer, she couldn't work properly. So it was not, she was not in a good place. And by changing her lifestyle and changing her nutrition and, um, exercising and meditating and all of those things that holistic approach she you know six months later she was in fantastic shape she looked you know like the healthiest person on earth um but the form of uh, ms that she has is very aggressive and it affects different people in different ways so luckily you know research medical research has helped and we've got a medication now that that helps her to to keep that at bay as well um but you know, we talked about nutrition and how that affects immunity. It is the holistic approach. It is your lifestyle as well, because 
stress has an effect on your immune system. You know, so now in fact, talk to your doctor. If you're stressed, you depress your immune system. If you're an athlete and you overtrain, that's stress as well. That's putting stress on your body. You suppress the immune system, you get sick. Simple as 100%. that. 100%. That's so true. And it's what's interesting about this is there may be someone listening right now that goes, hey, I've got a, an autoimmune disease and I want to start taking action to try and uh, make, give myself the best chance to, to get healthy or be kind of sustain the mm -hmm. lifestyle that I want and the health that I want. But there's also people out there that are perfectly healthy and will be waiting for something to happen before they take action. But prevention really is the best medicine. And so when I look at what you guys do with your products, we should be taking those before we get sick if, if we have the opportunity to do that. If we have the luxury uh, of not having any disease or any challenges, we should be doing that before that stuff on sets and before the stress compounds, right? Oh, absolutely. It, it's easier to prevent than to cure, for sure. Mm. And the science behind it, like you guys have this formula. I'd love to chat more about the, the, the greens side of it. <laughs> What's the science behind it? Who do you consult? Who, who helps you to bring that all together? Um, we use experts in the field because I don't have a background in nutritional bioscience and neither does Monique. We've learned a lot over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, but we use people who know what they're talking about, experts in their field from, from all over the world. So we have nutritionists on staff, but we use, you know, PhD bioscientists out of the, the UK. We, we use a lot very close to our, our businesses, uh, Dr. Cliff Harvey in Auckland. Uh, he's a, got a PhD in nutrition, uh, very, very active in the, in the uh, community over there. And he helps us a lot with our formulas and guides us, but we also seek advice from others. So it becomes a, a collaborative affair when we check with, it might be someone who has a master's degree in sports nutrition, and they have their view on certain things versus a PhD scientist sitting in the UK that we use and another one in New Zealand. So we we gather expertise to put together the, the formulas. And what you do have to remember is the science is always changing. We really don't know. We haven't scratched the surface of all of these nutrients that are in the foods that, and, and in our bodies. Um, you know, they talk about the 24 essential vitamins and minerals, but then now, now all the micronutrients and um, subcategories are proving to be just as essential as the essential ones. And so they're finding out new things every day. And what was true yesterday is not necessarily true tomorrow. So it is an evolving situation and we try and keep up with it as much as we can. There's a lot of research out there. Um, and of course, research finds things well ahead of, uh, I guess, established regulatory rules and uh, medical practices. Um, research is there first, so you can't necessarily use some of the ideal solutions because the, reg the in some cases regulations are forty years old. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. in, in New Zealand, for example, you know that we we use a form of B twelve methyl cobalamin, so it's already methylated. It's already the active form your body uses. It means you don't have to convert it because if you're a bit ill then your body not, might, might not be functioning properly, so you can't convert it to the, the active form. Now, you can actually put the active form in the formula, but the Food Standards Australia and New Zealand have this, this list of forms of ingredients that you're allowed to use. You're not allowed to use methylcobalamin. Now, in the US you can, in Europe you can, but in Australia and New Zealand, they haven't got around to fixing the regulations yet. Wow. You have to constantly evolve the formulas in line with both the research and regulations to make sure, because obviously we sell all over the world, so we need to make sure we've got the most effective product, but it also has to be legal to sell in every country. Yeah, wow, what a challenge. And if we kind of uh, take a moment and shine the spotlight on the business side of it. So prior to doing what you're doing now with New Zest, you didn't run a business. You, you said you, know, you were in, in the army, you were in the military before that. Tell me about the business journey, what you've learned along the way, what some of the big challenges have been. I, I've been in business before. I, I was in, the, the Navy was my first career. So I, I did spend 15 years in the Navy, but I left the Navy and went into the property business. In fact, I was the CEO of uh, Collies International in New Zealand for a number of years. So um, I've had some business experience and I have formed other businesses here. And I was uh, developed childcare centers uh, for a number of years. And that's the business I sold out of when Minnie got sick. So I've had business experience and admin experience. 
what we haven't had is experience in this type of business, manufacturing products in the health supplement sector. So that that is all new. Managing business and finance and business plans and people, all of that is you know fairly second nature. It's quite easy. But uh, the actual industry itself has been a very, very steep and sometimes very expensive learning curve. <laughs> and what have been some of those big uh, learnings or those lessons that if you could go back or maybe someone sitting at that point right now that's listening, that you could give them some advice on some of your biggest uh, learnings? Look, I think that the first thing is, is that, um, look, when, when, you, when you go through your career and you, you're in a particular industry, you develop a, a body of learning and experience that you don't appreciate how value, how valuable that is because you make decisions and do things based on all of that experience that you've seen before. So when you go into something new, and look, entrepreneurs go in blind most of the time. That's why probably 95% of small businesses fail. Um, you really have to do some homework and understand the nature of the business that you're, that you're getting into. You know, the regulatory side of things, if you're, if in our particular case, we're producing product that, um, you know, that has a shelf life attached to it. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, different ways you can distribute the product. There's this whole new online thing that's come on. So there's all these new things continually evolving. So the more you can prepare yourself beforehand and get advice from people who have already been there and done that, that are in the industry, uh, the better off you are. And if you can afford it, employ people with experience. Yeah, that's because, always been your advice, your business advice to me is employ people that know more than you do. Yeah. In whatever area you use. Um, you're better off paying more to get a person that's had experience rather than saying, I can't afford this, this good designer or this good production person or whatever it is because, you know, we're, we're a startup. So what you do is you make mistakes and you get there more slowly. So, but you've really got to take the plunge and employ good people, employ experienced people who know what they're doing because it will save you time and it will save you money in the long run. Mm -hmm. And it's that longer term thinking, I guess, the long game as opposed to short term uh, ROI when you're employing those, those heavy hitters. So going through COVID and what's been happening geopolitically, how has that been for you guys to navigate? Because you distribute all over the world. We do. It's, it's certainly been challenging. Uh, the first thing has been the supply chain issue and with the, the scarcity of ships that were sailing around the world, the increase in the freight costs, the scarcity of ingredients, it's just delayed everything. So the challenge has actually been not only being able to absorb the margins of the higher costs, but actually getting product made. And then once it's made, getting it delivered. We've got also a lot of facilities that are running, you know, for the last three years, they've been running at half staff, limited capacity, so they can't produce the product as quickly as they used to be able to. So it's now not a case of doing the forecasting a year in advance. It's, you know, three years in advance and making sure everything's booked in. So we're, ha we're having to forecast our core ingredient requirements 18 months ahead. Uh, we are having to place orders six months ahead. Now, and then they're delayed by six months. So let's call it time. <laughs> yeah. So there, there, you know, an example would be that you might be look, looking at a packaging component that you're, you're buying, and it might have taken 10 days to get, you know, pre-COVID. Uh, it now takes six weeks to three months to get that component. You might say, well, source it locally. So you source it locally. Let's say you use a an HCP plastic jar, whatever it is, whatever the, the packaging is. Um, and yes, they manufacture it here in Australia and they manufacture it in New Zealand, but where do they get their raw material to manufacture it? They get it in China. <laughs> China's closed down, there's no ships coming here, there are no containers, can't make the jars. Uh, so, you know, it's a, the, the world is very, it's, it's one big global, it's one big factory and we're, we're interdependent on it each other um, and that I don't see that going away in a hurry either yeah of course and that's obviously forced you to update and refine your systems and processes so you know what's been the biggest thing you've had to change it because to forecast that far out that I mean that's that's a huge shift and a huge challenge what what's had to be put in place for you to do that um, first thing the disciplines with 
each of our distributors because we've got businesses in different parts of the world. So getting those disciplines in place to make sure that they're they are forecasting and checking their stock and, and being diligent about that and, and getting those uh, those orders into us early and those forecasts into us early. The second thing that we've had to do, and I talked about sourcing locally, um, is that we have set up manufacturing operations. We, we don't manufacture ourselves, we use contract manufacturers, but we've established relationships in the regions that we operate. So we now use contract manufacturers in New Zealand, Australia, UK and USA, so that we're mitigating our risk and we're shortening the supply chain. That's brilliant. And as you see things moving forward and we're starting to expand again, we've been contracting for a few years, but things are slowly starting to expand. Where are you guys taking the company? What's what's the, the vision uh, for, for you all? Uh, that's an interesting question because we're at that stage where we are not small, we're not big. So you, we have a, an infrastructure cost that is expensive, um, but that infrastructure can handle a much bigger business. As you grow, especially when you, you're producing product, your need for working capital grows. Just like we've got $5 million worth of stock sitting around at any one time. So to grow from that, you need a lot more money to grow. So I guess from us, our decision right now was what do we want to do? Do we just want to organically grow and stay where we are? Or do we want to um, get an extra capital, actually grow the business to the, uh, and realize the potential of the business? Because there is potential there for us to grow exponentially. So that's where we are, we are right now. And in fact, we will probably go into a capital raising uh, but that is the we're at the worst possible time in the, uh, in the financial cycle to do that. Uh, but that doesn't matter. Uh, for good businesses, there's still capital around. So that's probably what we'll do. Either that or I um, sell my house and put that into the business. I love it. Good. I love it. And it's interesting, you know, thinking back to your work with Colliers and now with, with what you're both doing collectively leading the company, decision-making is is not difficult when times are good right you know when things are great and everyone's comfortable and the economy's going great decision making it's, it's not that difficult but decision making in turbulent times um decision making under pressure that's when it's very difficult so do you do you have individually or collectively have a process that you go through uh, when making tough decisions to try and be collaborative and, and, and to be joined in that, that end up result uh we do we, we've well Yes, we do. And it is a matter of working with each of the managers in the different regions and my CFO. And then we work out budget wise where we are, what we can afford, what we do. So we go through a very uh, disciplined process of budget forecasting and market analysis in each market and then bring those all together. I've got a very experienced CFO. We just put the numbers together. And you have to make decisions based on the numbers and on the market opportunity, and then you, you make a risk assessment. So mm -hmm. when you when you own the business, and which I essentially do, then it's a bit easier to make those decisions. Um, if you're in a larger business and you've got shareholders that you are beholden to, then you have to justify those decisions. So in many ways those decisions are probably better because they are far more disciplined and you have to actually be able to put those down on paper or articulate the reasons for the decisions you've made or the decisions you want to make with the approval of the board. Um, with, with an owner operator, you are probably less risk averse, but also you're not accountable. So in many ways it's dangerous. And in that case, yeah, we, debate. <laughs> we debate internally, <laughs> but I think that we're lucky because I've got a very good CFO and I've got a very good team of people who um, who make rational decisions and rational recommendations. But if you don't have those people around you, you need to go out, you, you need some outside advice, you need an advisor, you need a financial advisor um, who you can go to, other business people that have had experience that you can sit down and talk with articulate your plan, get their views. Just don't make a decision without any advice. That's great. And I, I look at both of you and I think 
so many times we're told not to get into business with family. It's just too tough and it's, it doesn't work. So for you guys, what's your experience working together and how, how, have you, how do you continually manage that relationship? I'll let Monique answer that because as a father, I'm very happy to have my daughter working with me. So it's up to her. We actually work well together, but we operate in very separate sides of the business. And I think that's probably where the harmony comes from. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say there. Like it's, you know, obviously the relationship in a family business is very different and it changes the dynamic for the rest of the staff as well. But as a whole, our we have a really good relationship with all of our team members around the world. So it's it's quite informal a lot of the time, but everyone feels like part of the family. So I think that's something when you come and work at Newsest, you accept that it's a family business, but it's a very big family business and it works well. I think also that the nature of the way this business started, it was, you know, it was a combination of Monique and me. It wasn't me having a business and my daughter coming into the business. She was very much a part of the foundation of the business. So that's a different dynamic. Um, and she knows a lot more about many things that I do. So I've got no choice but to have a... I love it. Like I said, very different sides of the business and they complement each other and it works well. That's amazing. And if we were to dig underneath the hood a little bit and, and for the listener to get a, a bit of a feel for the, the purpose that drives the business, what's the underlying purpose uh, of what you guys do? <laughs> well, no, it is. It's to it's the, when I was looking for health advice and nutrition advice, it was so complicated and there were so many products and there was so much to learn. And it was, I think for a lot of people, they struggle with health because it's overcomplicated. So our mission is to make it easy for people. It's to say, look, here is a really clean, effective product. Um yeah, it's, it's not a huge learning curve. We, we have, we, you know, our objective is to make, we're plant-based, but you know, I'm not a vegan. I know you're a vegan, but I'm not a vegan. But we have a number of vegans, vegetarians, flexitarians uh, in, in our company. And when we started, the, the plant-based market really wasn't as advanced as it is today. But we set out with the purpose of making sure that our products were suitable for everyone. That means we have to cater to vegans, vegetarians, flexitarians, uh, people on different types of diets, people with allergens. So we wanted to make products that were high quality, that had efficacy, that were clean, that they didn't have any, anything artificial in there, they didn't have stuff in there that upset the digestive system, um, products that were good for you and products that people could, that people could trust. Uh, and that came about because of Monique's situation. And we've been in that situation where who do you believe? Who do you trust? Is this is this product good for you? Is it not? What's in it? So we just wanted to make sure that our anyone who came along and said, I'm going to buy this Newsies product, I know that it's probably it's certainly not going to harm most people and hopefully it won't harm me. I mean, there are exceptions in the world where people that have, we've got one customer in the US, for example, who started taking our protein, just the, the, uh, the plain plant protein, no flavor. And that's all she could take. Um, and it was the only protein that didn't give her digestive issues. She's got severe digestive issues, very, very severe. She can't take even natural flavors. So she can't even take our vanilla, for example. She has problems with any product that has natural flavors in it. So she's very limited. She couldn't get any protein, but she found that she could take the, the plain protein. So there are these exceptions in the world <laughs> that where people have very, very severe allergies. We have a hypoallergenic, the, you know, no gluten, no soy, no dairy, shellfish, any of those things. Um, but there are people in the world that are allergic to peas. And even though most of the peas gone in the pea protein, you know, it's 90, it's 86% protein and the rest is a, a bit of fiber and, you know, carbohydrates, there's still an element of pea there. So we've had, I don't know, two occasions. I think in the last decade. Yeah, two in the last 10 years of people that have ended up finding out they're allergic to peas because then they had a reaction to the pea protein. Wow. So <laughs> you, can be as, you, can, you can be as diligent as you as you want to be, you know, hundred, give it 110%, but um, there are people, unfortunately, in the world that have some really, really severe problems. 
and your people, you know, your, your, your clients, the people that are really benefiting from, from these products, how do you reach them? Is it um, a B2C model, B2B, a bit of a combo of both? Yeah, we're multi-channel. Uh, we sell online. We sell through Amazon in different countries. We all, we're all we also in store. So we're in New Zealand. We're a big part of your your listener or your, your fan base is. Uh, we've been around in that market. We launched in New Zealand because we're, we're from New Zealand. So we had an affinity to the country. And I had a good friend over there that wanted to get involved in the business. So uh, we did it together. So you know, we're in all the health food stores over there. We're also going to be purchased online. Um, and through different health practitioners, there are a number of you know sports people, particularly professional sports people, that were also introduced to the product. So all of a sudden, we found that we had a whole range of sports people taking the product, even though we didn't set out to be a sports brand. But as I said, the product is is there to be suitable for everyone to give a, a good solid foundation to nutrition to fill the gap. So you know we've we've got. A lot of high profile rugby players in New Zealand. We supply certain teams in New Zealand when they go into camp. <laughs> and, uh, I love it. I, I, I can talk about, you know, I can talk about the, the famous number 12, Ma Nonu, who's, a, who's been taking our products, I think, since we started. Um, and he still takes them and he's still playing rugby at the age of 41, 42. I think he's got another season in San Diego this year. And in his last World Cup, he took his, he took his boots and he he wrote on them. He said, thanks to New Zest for keeping me on the field. And he sent them to us. That's um, amazing. Yeah, yeah. And he's, you know, he's a, he's a good, you know, he didn't ask for anything. Uh, he's just a, a tre- tremendous guy. He used to he used to go into stores in Wellington and start signing footballs when we were doing a promotion. <laughs> I love it. That is so good. I love it. And I'll be, I'll share my experience. So um, as a plant-based eater, uh, I wanted to try and find more protein. And so I was having morning smoothies and I was looking at these um, pea protein based um, proteins and they all tasted terrible. So I was like, I can't do this. And then my partner Caroline came across your plain protein yeah. and it was brilliant. That's the only one I've found still that mm-hmm. actually works really well and doesn't taste horrible. And, they, yeah. and by taste, I mean the texture as well. A lot mm-hmm. of the, the, the proteins uh, and the powders, the, 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 the texture is just not nice. Uh, the plant-based ones, you've, whatever you've done, mm-hmm. you've hit the nail on the head. So well yeah. done. Look, it's all, it's, it's all about the isolation process. So we get our uh, protein from Belgium um, and the company that produces that are really the leaders in pea protein isolation. So all the peas are grown in Northern France. Uh, they, they actually supply the, uh, the farmers with the seeds so they can, they're controlling the quality. Of, of the peas that they're getting into their facility. They're very sustainable, like peas are a sustainable crop anyway, because they, they use less water, they use less soil than the other production, other forms of production of protein, but they also barge the stuff to their facility. They use the waste for biofuel and anim, animal, uh, animal feed. Uh, they produce their own power, so that all the, all the water is purified and recycled. So they're a really, really good company, but it's their process that is the difference. So you'll find that the powder is very, very fine. So it absorbs very easily. Uh, it gets rid of virtually all of the anti-nutrients. So it's lectin free. And the anti-nutrients are the things that interfere with digestion and give you bloating and all of those sorts of things. So there's none of that in there. Um, and that's all down to the isolation process. And when you've got that, you, you don't have that grittiness, it's very fine, and you don't have that heavy pea smell, and that means it's easy to flavor. And you don't have to add anything to give it a smooth texture. So a lot of proteins, you'll see that they, they've got to add some sort of masking agent to cover the smell. They add gums to employ emulsifiers to improve the mouthfeel to try and get it a bit smoother. When you don't have to have all of those things, there's less and less chance of it interfering with digestion, and therefore it's more digestible. And that's why it tastes good and it's smooth. We don't do anything to it. We we simply add flavor. We say it's the quality. That's right. Of the raw ingredients, and we simply add a natural flavor and a natural sweetener, which is from the contemporary fruit. Um, it's the protein extract, which is a very, very sweet, much sweeter than sugar. It's a very tiny amount that goes in, and that's how we flavor it. So it's pretty simple. 
Nice. I love your attention to detail and your passion for, as you say, that the raw ingredients has got to be top notch. It's got to be world class. And yeah. I can see why someone like Manonu, who's world class, uh, really wants to use a brand that also has the same values and same ethos as he does for his profession. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's, it is important. It's particularly important. And yeah, it, it's a big problem in the industry because, you know, there's all sorts of claims and you can make on a label and things you can leave off a label. And uh, yeah, I thought that, look, the industry is good, but you still have to be careful. And it's the consumer in the end is the one that pays the price one way or the other. That's right. Yeah. It comes down to the health price, doesn't it? And rather than the cost price. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> 100%. Well, I just want to say a massive thank you to you both for, for sharing your story and sharing what you do. And I'm going to make sure to put in the show link as well if people want to go and actually try the product. And I would strongly urge them to try the product if they haven't before, uh, whether that's the greens or whether that's the proteins. Your full range is incredible. So I'll be sure to put a link uh, to where they can do that. Uh, but just before we part, I've got one last question. And I'd, I'd love for both of you to, to share your individual thoughts on it. If we get to the end of life, and it's your last day, and you know it's your last day, and a very young person in your life, maybe it's a grandchild, asks you, how do I lead my life on purpose? What advice would you have for them? Find your passion and follow it. Mm, I love it. Yeah, find something that you love doing and do it every day. I love it. That's so great. Well, make sure and spread that word. And for the listener, please take note and share that with someone today. But a massive, massive thank you to you both. Uh, I look forward to, to meeting you in person next time I'm in Sydney. I'll be sure to drop in and, and check out what you're doing and check out the operation. Thanks, uh, David, and thank same. you for having us on the show. Thanks a lot. Very nice. Uh, absolutely. It's a pleasure. Hey, guys, if you enjoyed the content today, please smash that subscribe button below. And if you want to become part of my community, I've got an amazing free Facebook group. Please come and join us. The link is in the description below. And also, if you've got any questions about today's session, I'd love to know. Just comment below and I'll be sure to get back to you guys. Have the most amazing day.